problem. So how can we solve this conflict between Adam and Eve being our common uh, descendants, like, like our forefather and they coming out directly from, from clay, like Adam coming out from directly from the clay. I think this belief is not in contradiction with evolution. Why? So many people, when I say that I personally believe in evolution, they think that I, I think that Adam has a father. And Does and, that make you a naturalist sort of uh, ideas? Uh, no, it doesn't make you naturalist. Believing in evolution doesn't make you a naturalist. So evolution is a scientific theory, with, and many evolutionists were taste, and still today they are taste. Like being evolutionist, accepting the theory of evolution doesn't make you a, a, a naturalist. So how can we reconcile these two theories? The theory uh, that Adam was made from the clay and he's our forefather. I think there are at least two ways you can uh, reconcile these two claims. One approach is what I call Haldunian approach, or Ibn Haldunian approach. So Ibn Haldun faced a similar uh, problem. Uh, so in Hadith, as you know, uh, it's told that Adam was as tall as 40 meters. And uh, many people at the time of Ibn Haldun find this statement to be false from their scientific understanding, because human seems to be like at most two, two and something meters tall. So, 40 meters seems to be extremely high number, so they, they were thinking that this hadith must be uh, weak. Ibn Aldous' answer was very simple. Yes, you are right. In, in Earth there are no beings which are, no humans which are taller than, say, two meters and something. And if Adam was also two meters and something, but he was 40 meters uh, tall in heaven, in Jannah. So, mm -hmm. uh, actually, this hadith is talking about Jannah, while science we are doing is talking about that. So if we differentiate these two realms, there's no actually contradiction between the claim that no humans can be 40 meters tall and Adam was 40 meters tall. One is a claim about Jannah, original place at which Adam was created. The second claim is about Earth. So we can follow the same strategy. We can say that the story given in the Quran that humans, that Adam was created from clay directly is actually uh, valid story for paradise, for Jannah, for, for hell, which but we must not say that this, you know, you are just escaping from the uh, Quranic understanding of um, the creation. One might claim that uh, looking for alternative, uh, looking for options for the story of the creation of Adam uh, is escaping from the Quranic text. And, you know, one, one can claim this and you know because this is like the understanding we have been understanding the text until this day and the uh, Mufassirun, the, the, the commentators of Quran have understood it in this way for hundreds of years. So this claim and, and your alternative idea comes from the 19th and 20th centuries scientific uh, experiments or um, uh, you know ideas. So how 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 would how how would we answer to, to this question? How would we say that what we are doing, looking alternative models, is something that can be done? Well, I don't think that I'm modifying the traditional understanding here. Actually, the traditional understanding is that Adam was created in in Jannah in heaven, and he was created directly from the clay. The question then, which is not answered in the in the text, and which many options have been considered, is how did Adam came from the Jannah to Earth? Yes, there are some stories that uh, about the places they, they appeared on Earth, but again, there's no mechanism how they appeared. So how is it that Adam went, came out from paradise to Earth? And clearly there's no answer for this in the, in the uh, authentic hadiths or in the Quran. So this is a gap in our knowledge. And of course we are free to, to put scientific facts to close this gap. So this is not a modification of the traditional understanding. So this story that Adam was created out from the clay uh, directly by God and then sent to earth is what traditional uh, sources say. And science says that Adam has, uh, we humans have common descent with other animals. How can we reconcile this? There are many ways we can reconcile. One can say that Adam was recreated second time on earth with evolutionary process. Or you can say that Adam came down directly from heaven and his grandchildren or 
grand grandchildren were married with uh, creatures which were evolved on Earth. So we are descendants both from Adam and his children, but we are also descendants of uh, other creatures which uh, sons, grandsons of, of Adam uh, married with. So can we say that these narratives are in contradiction with Quran and Hadith? I would say no. Are they, are they in contradiction with traditional understanding? I would say no. Yes, they are new and they should be new. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's not being discussed in this way, in this form, it looks like it is against the tradition. Then, the, you know, there are some uh, scholars who say, okay, if, if the Quran said it, this, this is the way we have created Adam, and then you don't look other alternative ways of uh, creation, or you, can, you don't, like, sort of make up stories uh, for the story of the creation. So, you know, there is there's always uh, objections to this idea, but... Uh, from from my understanding, what you're saying is that um, the explaining evolution in alternative terms is not to, it does not necessarily make us go into denying the traditional understanding of uh, yes. creation of Adam exactly. and Adam. And then uh, that our intention is not to do that, of course. So then we can work on um, these scientific uh, arguments freely and uh, with confidence. So that we can eventually find a more um, non-contradicting answer to these questions, but this is you know you know usually a uh, for the public it's complicated. Yes. So for for uh, like uh, some someone who is staying in a village hearing about these discussions, why what would you say for a for a general Muslim or or theist to think how how should they think about these issues and how should they fit these ideas into their minds? So, uh, what I would say is that you shouldn't talk about uh, scientific theories you don't understand. Similarly, like you shouldn't talk about uh, religious issues you don't understand. So, these debates are uh, uh, an expert debates and uh, debates which should be done, done among the experts. So, lay people, they don't really understand the theory of evolution. I would say most of the Muslim scholars today who have not taken a good scientific education, they don't understand the evolution. And you cannot evaluate the theory which you don't really understand. So they don't even understand what kind of evidence there is in favor of evolution. So without really knowing what kind of evidence there is for evolution, without knowing what evolution is, going to debates would be false, like would be extremely dangerous. So have you seen a light person talking about quantum mechanics and evaluating it? No. Probably uh, most of them, maybe all of them, they don't understand what quantum mechanics is. So they shouldn't go to the uh, discussion of the implications of quantum uh, theory for the religion. So similar altitude to be is, uh, needs to be done about uh, theory of evolution. They should leave this to the experts. And if they are curious, then they need to uh, talk, see what these experts say, and they need to understand both evolution and the, the relevant verses in Quran and Hadith which are relevant for this debate. If you don't understand this, for example, uh, my personal approach is, as you can see, I don't uh, modify uh, the claims in the tradition. I say, let's take the claims in the tradition at face value and try to reconcile with evolution. Because not, I'm not a religious scholar, so I have no authority to, to question the traditional understanding. But some uh, scholar, which is a tefsir scholar, may give some other arguments, some other modifications to the traditional understanding and reconcile with evolution. My claim is even more radical. I say you don't need to modify the tradition, and I, I don't have the authority to modify the tradition. So as a scientist and philosopher, I have some comment, in, I, I have some knowledge about evolution. So I'm trying to reconcile this picture with the tradition, and I think this can be done. A religious scholar may, may take uh, the scientific theory as a fact. He shouldn't try to to to, to uh, question the scientific theory. He can, for example, modify the claims in the religion. If there is need, I think there is no need, but reinterpret them, uh, correct them. But like person, he has neither command in religious sciences nor in scientific uh, issues, then trying for them to combine would be extremely dangerous and talking about these issues. So I think Yes, if you are an educated person, you can talk, you can read, you can follow the debate. But I think this debate should be taken out from the context of lay, lay person. So lay person, I think, shouldn't be really concerned about these debates.